Welcome to Penrith Church. Adventists seem to find it easy to say, I will die for the truth. We believe the truth, don't we? The truth about what's written here in the Bible. And one of our favourite stories we always like to go to is in Daniel chapter 3. And we look at this from a, a prophetic point of view and say that this kind of situation may happen in the future and when it does, I'm going to stand for the truth. Just to give you a bit of a background on Daniel chapter 3, it's a time of when the Israelites are in captivity in Babylon. They're out of their comfort zone. And there was a king named Nebuchadnezzar Quite a long name with, I don't know how many letters, about 15 letters. That's something the children can have a look at. Count how many letters in the word Nebuchadnezzar. It's bad enough to spell. Well, this man was basically the king of the world. He had conquered all the empires and he had taken the best people of all the different nations to Babylon to train them up, to use their wisdom to go and basically help him keep control of the people. In Daniel chapter 2, if you remember from our prophecy seminars, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and in this dream there's this big image and there's a head of gold, a chest of silver and we go on. And in that dream, Daniel actually gives the interpretation and says, King, you're that head of gold but after you will arise another kingdom. And Nebuchadnezzar wasn't really happy about that because he thought, I am the king of this world and I want Babylon to go forever. And so in Daniel chapter 3, we find that the king actually makes an image, not like the one in the dream that was gold, silver, bronze, but an image totally out of gold to say that I'm going to be here forever and no one is ever going to move me from my place. And just to make sure that everyone understands this, I'm going to get all the rulers, the governors, all the people that I've trained up in my universities, we're going to get together, I'm going to tell them, look at that image and I want to you to fall down and worship that image. That's where the story comes and we find that there are three Jews, three Israelites, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And if you know the, the Bible pretty well, turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, we find that God has actually given them some commandments. We call them the, the Ten Commandments. You've heard of the Ten Commandments? I'm sure you have. And you probably, some of you, could recite them off by heart. But the very first commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, it says in verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4, You shall not make any carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. And you shall not bow down to them or serve them. What was this thing that Nebuchadnezzar had made? It was a huge golden image. And what was he asking them to do? Bow down to it. But what did God tell the Israelites? Don't do it because I am your God. I love you. I am jealous for you. You only bow down to me. And there comes the conundrum. Because Nebuchadnezzar says anyone who does not bow down to that golden image will die. Would they serve God? Would they serve man? Turn with me, I want to go specifically to the verse here in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, one that we enjoy reading and I guess we hope to believe it's true for us because the three Hebrew captives, they did not bow down to the image and Nebuchadnezzar was enraged and brought them to him and said, why aren't you bowing down? Next time when I play the music, and everyone else bows down to that image to worship it, I want you to do it as well. But we find that in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. We don't need a second chance. We've already made our decision. If this is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. We will follow God even if it means 
that we will die for it. It's great to be part of a cause, isn't it? You get fired up. Just uh, yesterday or the day before, I was reading on the ABC news on the internet about how a 12-year-old girl has been given permission by a court that she can have an abortion because they're worried about her mental health afterwards. And the baby's about three, four months old. And it fires me up. I guess probably because my wife and I don't have children and we see, why don't you have that child? We would love to have a child. And we get caught up with a cause. It's easy to go and point the finger at people who have abortions and call them people who, who kill their babies and forget about what it's all about. And I think as Adventists we get so caught up with what is right, what is truth, that we will stand up for the truth. But we forget What's this truth about? Why does God say don't worship anyone else? It's because he loves us. We may die for a truth, but will we die for a relationship? Most of you, I guess, are part of a family. Maybe you're married. Would you die for your husband? Really? Would you die for your wife? Would you die for your children? Your parents? Really? It's one thing to say it's in the comfort of the church that we're in this morning. You know, the air conditioners are not quite on. I think they are on. We're comfortable. We're not too hungry because it's not lunchtime yet and I've still got 25 minutes to preach. And you're sort of nodding to yourself, yeah, I would die for my wife. I would die for my children. I love them. Really? You know, we tithe. But do we give freely to others with the rest of our money? We find it reasonably easy to set aside a 24-hour period called a Sabbath for God, but do we set aside time for our family? It's easy to say to my wife, I will die for you. But when she asks me, Mike, I need some help in the kitchen to do the dishes, sometimes it seems more harder to do that. I sometimes worry that what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23 might be so often applied to us. Now Jesus spent three and a half years on this earth with his people. And the people he loved and worked with so much were the religious people of that time, the Pharisees. He loved them and wanted them to understand that they were missing the whole point. They kept the Ten Commandments but forgot about who the Ten Commandments are about and the one who gave them. In Matthew 23, verse 23, he says to them, Woe, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, you're hypocrites. For you pay tithe on mint and anise and cumin and five-cent pieces. You have neglected the weighty matters of the law, justice, mercy, faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. It's one thing to stand up and say, I will die for the truth, but would you put your life at stake for someone else? Maybe a loved one, but what about an enemy? I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 24 at this, this wonderful story that I, I read again last night and it just amazed me once again. 1 Samuel is a book that spends a lot of time talking about King David. Do you remember David? He's the one who slew Goliath, the hero. But at the same time, he wasn't king. It was Saul who was the first king of Israel. David killed Goliath. And Saul got a bit jealous. 
People started flocking to David more. And the Bible talks about their singing songs. You know, Saul has slewed his sl- slain, what a word, slain his thousands, but David, he slays tens of thousands. And Saul saw David as a threat to the throne and, sorry, and Saul wanted David to be killed. And David had no choice. He had to flee to the wilderness with his band of... Um, I wasn't going to say misfits, but his his band of people, other people who probably had problems with Saul, they banded together, but they always had to stay in hiding. Year after year, Saul tried to pursue them, to kill them. Now, if you you were David, what would you do? Because, interestingly enough, we find in the book of Samuel that David, at a young age, is anointed to be the next king. David knows that God has already decided that he's to be the next king. It's just a matter of time. Saul is still alive, but he's going to be next. In, da- in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 24, we read of a very interesting encounter. Now it happened, let's read from verse 1. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men, the best of his army, and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goat. So he came to a sheepfold by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. But the Bible says, that in that cave, David and his men were staying. The enemy of David was going into David's territory all alone. Verse 4, Then the men of David said to him, This is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, and you may do to him as it seems good to you. This is the day. This is the day that the kingdom's going to come to David because Saul is now in the power of David. All you have to do is kill him. Because David was a favorite amongst the people. Even the soldiers who followed Saul would more than happily follow David. All he had to do was kill the leader. So the men of David, they watched as David arose. But instead of killing Saul... He secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. That's strange. Verse 5, Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to, to my master, the Lord's anointed. What's he calling Saul? His master, the Lord's anointed. Yeah, the Lord's anointed, I understand that. Um, Samuel anointed Saul as king a, a long time ago. But wasn't Saul the one trying to kill David? And yet David's saying, I, I can't do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he's the anointed of the Lord. Mate, if I was one of David's followers, I would really be angry now. David, we've been following you in this wilderness for so many years. We just can't sit down. We can't settle down with our families because Saul is out there to try and kill us all the time. And now you have this opportunity. You have the right to. This is self-defense. You could kill him because he's been pursuing you. He would do it at a moment's notice if he had you in this same situation. And now you won't do it? Well, we'll do it for you. But David, verse 7, restrained his servants with these words. He restrained him. He did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. Now, if the story ended there, I would still say, Mate, David, you're incredible. Why did you forgive and let your enemy go? But watch as we read on. David now puts his life on the line because he also doesn't want to be pursued for the rest of his life. He wants a resolution to this. He wants to confront Saul. But 
Saul, remember, had 3,000 of his chosen men outside that cave. And if David went out there, his life would be at risk. Verse 8, David also arose afterward, went out of the cave, and he called out to Saul saying, My Lord and King. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped his face to the earth and bowed down. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of the men that say, Indeed, David seeks your harm? Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord has delivered you today into my hand, into the cave, and someone urged me to kill you. But my eyes spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against the Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, I've, I've cut the corner of your robe. It's in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of the robe and did not kill you, Know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. Yet you hunt my life to try and kill me and take me. Let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. What a scene! As Saul stands there and beholds David in front of him with a piece of his robe. And I'm sure Saul looked around and said, Well, there's a piece missing, all right, and that's the other piece. And realizes that while he was attending to his needs, whatever that may mean, that David could have easily killed him and yet chose not to. What? kind of response what kind of response do you think Saul gave let's skip to verse 16 so it was when David had finished speaking these words to Saul that Saul said is this your voice my son David wow what a change how, how did he refer to David there son wasn't he out there to kill David? And yet something transpired, this story, this illustration of what David did transformed the heart of Saul in no other way that could be done. And he refers to David as his son. And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, you are more righteous than I, verse 17, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I would have rewarded you with evil. And you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you didn't kill me. For, come on, if, if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Therefore, May the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now I know, look at this statement, and now I know, Saul says, that indeed you shall surely be king and the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. If you had told Saul ten minutes earlier that he would be calling David his son and admitting that David was going to be the next king in line after him, he would have said, you're crazy. I hate that guy. He's taking the hearts of all my soldiers away from me because he seems to be you know, like the Ned Kelly that everyone seems to like. You're crazy. Nothing could change my mind. But what changed his mind? Willing to risk his life to show how much he loved Saul. Only love can change people. We're willing to die for the truth, but are we willing to die for relationship? We live in Cambridge Park. This is Penrith Church. We're happy to preach the Sabbath, the tithing, the sanctuary, that Jesus is coming again. 
But what are we doing to show love to our neighbours? And I'm preaching to myself here. This sermon is aimed at me. What sacrifice are you doing, are you going to do to show your love to your neighbour, to your friends? It's love that will do it. In Matthew chapter 24, I only really understood this verse. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, or 14, sorry. Matthew 24, verse 14. I only really understood this verse after Luke preached about a month ago. And to me, it's absolutely fascinating. Matthew 24, verse 14. You've heard it plenty of times, but have you ever really unpacked it? It says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? The good news. Good news about what? Jesus Christ dying for us, salvation. But if you, if you try and pack that into a, into a picture, basically it's the good news of who Jesus really is. Because there are so many lies out in the world about who God is. That God, if you do bad, he's going to strike you with lightning. How many have heard that? If you live a bad life and don't do good things, you're going to go to hell and you're going to, go, you're going to burn forever. And God's going to be watching you and saying, you've got to suffer for what you've done. That's the picture of God a lot of people have out there. It's a false picture of God. It's a lie. When you read the Bible, God isn't like that at all. The gospel is the good news of who God is, and it's preached as a witness. We need to present to people who God is. Do you get it? Let me give you a little bit of an illustration and I'm probably going to be a little bit politically incorrect as I give it to you. You're at home and you hear a knock on the door because the doorbell isn't working and I need a new battery in mine at the moment. You open the door and there you see a, a large, fat man. He's got a big smile on his face, really rosy cheeks, and he's a jolly guy. And you say, what can I do for you? And he says, look, we're giving away free books in this neighborhood. And you say, well, what's the book about? It's how you can lose weight in 26 steps. Ah, oh, interesting. Well, tell me, what do you think of the book? I think this book is great. How long have you been reading? I've been reading it for the last five years. It's fantastic. It's free. Would you like it? Think about it. That book could be the best book on losing weight. It could be the most well-researched book there is that guarantees that person who applies those principles that they will lose weight. But it won't be accepted because of the one who's trying to communicate it to the other person. Why would someone listen to you talking about the love of God when you really don't take any interest in them. And this this is what's hitting my heart. This is what God's saying to me. I've been working with my colleagues at work for the last two years and, and God says to me, you don't really love them. I like them, I get along with them. But they could come up to me and say, Mike, you know, you're a Christian, aren't you? I say, yes, you believe God is love. Yes, I believe God is love. And you really think love can change the world? And I say, yes, yes. And you're a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian, I'll follow Christ. I say, I've been working with you two years. Yeah, I know that. Well, tell me, um, how many children do I have? What's my husband do? What do I do on weekends? I don't really know. They could say to me, Mike, you're a good guy and everything, but look, if your God takes as much interest in people as you do, that's a real funny kind of love. It's... 
It's nice, but... How... How can I learn to love people? Last night at the Beyond Imagination program, as I was preaching that Jesus is the answer, God spoke to me and afterwards as well and, and said to me, Michael, if you don't love the people out there as individuals, you can't communicate my love to them the way I want you to. The way you act, the way you are, is the way people will see God. And that's, that's the, the wonderful thing about the gospel. <laughs> because I've gone to college and studied theology, and maybe, no, I don't think anyone else has. Has anyone else spent four years studying theology? Well, you know something? You don't need to. You don't even need to know that much about the Bible. You don't even have to sort of memorize different Bible verses. You need it in the heart. That's what's more important. Because when you talk to people and they see God in your heart and in your face, they are attracted to you. It doesn't matter how much you know, so long as you know the basics and you know that God loves you and has transformed you and has given you an interest in other people's lives to help them be transformed. Now this morning I asked God and I said, how, how can you give me that love? I want to turn to one final story in the Bible. I hope this will bring it out to you. In Matthew chapter 26, it's the last few hours of the life of of Christ. He's with his 12 disciples, well actually 11. He's in the garden of Gethsemane, it's night time. He's been praying to God because the, the agony of what's going to happen next is, is very overwhelming. He feels the, the sin of the whole world, the past, present, the future, our sins being burdened on him. He prays to God and says, God, please find another way out. But if this is the only way out that I have to go forward and die, I will do it because I love humanity. I love you. And after praying three times, an angel came and strengthened Jesus. And he got up. And this is where the action happens. While he was still speaking to his disciples who had fallen asleep, because it is pretty late at night. Verse 47 of Matthew chapter 26. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, Judas, the man he had spent three, three and a half years with, one of the twelve. Can you imagine spending three and a half years in close proximity with other people and spending time with them, bonding with them? It must have been you know, absolutely fascinating to be with Jesus for that three and a half years, see him work, the disciples working together, trusting one another, relying on one another. And yet one of the twelve has come to betray Jesus to his death. A betrayer. And while he was speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords, with clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign to the other people, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. He's the one who has to die. Jesus is the one. Verse 49. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. That was the signal. The soldiers were about to come and rush on Jesus to take him. 
But yet in that split second, when Jesus confronts his betrayer, the one who had been with him for three and a half years, who invested so much time and energy because Jesus loved this man and knew that he had turned on him, how does Jesus respond? But Jesus, verse 50, said to him, Friend, tell me something, does Jesus lie? Does Jesus exaggerate? Jesus tells the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when it says in here, Jesus called him friend, did Jesus mean that? Despite what you're doing to me, Judas, I still call you friend. Friend, why have you come? I'm sure those words echoed in Judas's mind. But look, that is how Jesus reacted to his betrayer. Then they came, they laid hands on Jesus and took him. Verse 51, and suddenly one of those who were with Jesus struck out his hand and drew his sword. Do you know who this person was? Another gospel, it says of Peter. Who do you think Peter was going for with that sword? Because he's really crazy. There is a great multitude of people out there. There is no way that he could go and cut down and mow down those Roman soldiers. The soldiers weren't the people he was aiming at. Do you know who he was aiming at? I'm guessing I'm reading in the lines here. He was going for Judas. How could you do this, Judas? We trusted you right to the last moment. We thought you were with us. We thought in the upper room that you were going out to buy some bread so we'd have some more, that you were going to help the poor. But here you are with the enemy. You're ready to betray the man that has looked after you, comforted you, trained you for the last three and a half years. And now you betray him. Forty-eight hours later, and probably for the rest of their lives, the disciples would go back to that moment and look at the contrast. Jesus loved his enemies. And the best we could do was try and kill them. By observing Jesus, only by looking at Jesus, by reading about him in his word, can we become like him. I can't become like Jesus on my own, and neither can you. But when we study his life and ask him to come into our lives, that is when he can change the revenge, the fear, the anger into a love that is beyond comprehension. This morning, I want to make a simple call. I, if you want to love Jesus so much that it propels you to love other people like he does, I want you to raise your hand. All you have to do is study the life of Christ. And when you study, you ask the Holy Spirit and say, Jesus... I want you to reproduce that life in me because I want to become a man who is not afraid of death, not afraid of the enemy. I want to be the man or the woman who when the storms of evil come against, I will just produce good. Where there's curses, I want to be able to bless. When they strike my on the one cheek, I want to be able to have the power to turn the other and look him straight in the eye and say, I want to represent Jesus. I want to show you a picture of God that has changed me. Not someone who is out there to do you harm, but to do you good. Who will keep loving you despite what you do to me. Despite what you say. I want to be a picture of God that can be a witness to the whole world. So that Jesus can come very soon and make that all a reality in our lives.